we're really pri privileged to have um, these three speakers here tonight because they each represent, as you can see, different types of the art, different sectors of the art market. The auction house, the, the art gallery, and an art advisor or um, private dealer. Each sector has distinct characteristics that sometimes overlap and in other instances present options when buying or selling artworks. During our conversation tonight, similarities and differences will emerge. Alex, we read about the sensational fall and spring evening auctions. Those few occasions, while a highlight, encompass only a portion of what you do. Could you tell us, talk a little bit more about how you prepare for a sale, how you procure the art, uh, the pre-sale arrangements you make, and what, what the, what the run-up to an auction is? Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so, we focus in the, in, the, in the auction world in two big events in the contemporary art world. It's the May and the November, so the spring and the fall auctions. Um, there's a six month basically lead up time to every auction. Um, every auction, I'm now at the beginning of the cycle again. So I start with a blank slate. We talked about it a little bit today. So there's nothing the curatorial world thinks ahead, the auction world uh, scrambles. Um, so I sit there <clears throat> with my colleagues in the department and the chairman group and we think how can we put the next sale together. Um, some of it is proactive, some, a lot of it is reactive. The reactive business is very easy to explain. People call you because you are preeminent force, we are preeminent force in the, in, the, in the contemporary art world. So people come to us and say, could you sell this Warhol, could you sell this Liechtenstein for me? And of course I say yes, happily. Um, and um, the other part is that um, we proactively approach people, clients, collectors, that we know have works that might be just right now in favor, that um, saw a huge value increase. So it is time for literally cold call or cold visit clients that you're in touch with and say, what about selling this piece or what about selling this piece? The last time we looked at, um, I looked at your collection, it was worth X, now it's worth Y. Um, why don't you sell something to buy something new or you know, um, a different situation? We have two sales that we put together, two main sales. One is called the evening sale, which is the one that you read about in the newspaper. That's the one with the, um, few lots with big prices, that's where we make 20, 30, 40, 100 million dollars for objects. Um, and then there's the day sale, which is more the bread and butter, which is about 400 lots um, <coughs> that we catalog, consign and sell then on that day of the auction. The, the crazy, the wild thing about the auction business is you prepare for six months to get this together. You have lots of colleagues from, 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 from different areas that help you put the sale together, if it's chairman, if it's museum services. Um, and then you come to this evening and within two hours all your work is gone. Um, so it's a, it's, 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 it's a high for two hours and then there's a, there's a low point because you know you have to start from scratch the next day. Um, and this is really how the, how the, how the, 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 the cyclical art world evolves. We went from when I started, a contemporary evening sale was a $20 million sale. Then we grew to a $200 million sale, to a $400 million sale. Then everything collapsed in 2008, 2009. We went back to a $50 million sale and now we just finished a half a billion contemporary sale just a couple of weeks ago. So it's a wild roller coaster ride um, that you have to be willing to take on. And it's, it's fun and it's, it's exhausting, but um, you're surrounded by great art and you meet fascinating, you work with fascinating people and you meet fascinating people. Yeah. Well, auction houses are a resale marketplace and in contrast, an art gallery is what's called the primary market where you're bringing often fresh work to, to market. You're working directly with artists. You also work with collectors. So Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about that, about the primary market? Yeah, well, um, I often said, and I've mentioned this to you earlier, I really, um, I consider myself a really, a very good gallerist and not as much of a, a good art dealer per se. Now, and the difference being that, you know, in the, as an art dealer, you're sort of seeing objects and you're thinking about who you're connecting them to and who should, who wants what and how that all works. 
as a gallerist, I mean, I still end up selling quite a bit of art, but it's really out of the sort of direct uh, association that I have with the artist and working on their exhibitions. Um, for me, that is, that is the joy. That, that is why I'm in the business, is to work with these artists and um, help them create contemporary culture, um, which is also another reason why I want to be uh, focus on the contemporary market, so that I can be in the here and now and sort of see what people are doing in the present. Um, so I really, it kind of begins with going to artist studios constantly, <coughs> Some of them in my hometown in Los Angeles and some of them elsewhere and you're sort of constantly going to visit them. Even when you're not working on an exhibition, I mean, you just want to stay uh, on track and see what they're thinking about and what mm -hmm. they're doing. And um, even if they're working on exhibitions for other galleries, yeah, I'm, I'm often going to other cities and all over the world just to go and see what they're working on for that. Um, but really um, is to sort of give your expertise. I mean, I really do leave it up to the artist to sort of decide what it is that they want to do within the gallery. Um, but there is guidance that can be given, and I do think that there is um, there can be some really important editing to be done, and um, I think it, that uh, artists always appreciate, not always appreciate, um, sort of constructive criticism. But, um, <laughs> but I think it's important, because when you are really, uh, when you're sincere, I think it, 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 it comes across. And, um, so, so yeah, we just well, I, I I just enjoy that process of working on a show and then the incredible excitement of them presenting it to, you know in a, in a public context and um, and then you know you're also at the same time sort of fielding you know uh, interest and enthusiasm from collectors and not necessarily from people who are going to actually come to the brick and mortar space and see the work. Sometimes you know you're sending the work in on, in JPEGs. I mean I, honestly I don't know how how we did this job you know, before the age of the uh, internet. Um, but um, I'm glad we do have that um, option. But it, but it really is, it, for me, it's the excitement of being with the, with the artist, being with the work, and, and seeing the work in context. Um, and I think that that's really important. And it helps me sell the work, you know, and sort of understanding it in the, in very thoroughly. And, um, and then you just hope to place it in the right collections and then also get museum curators to come and, and also, you know, sort of try and um, spread the gospel and and um, and uh, you know sort of create enthusiasm writ large and uh, and then you know and then you move on to another exhibition six weeks later so it's incredibly fast paced I mean in the sense it, it's similar to a, in, a museum in the sense that you're sort of making these these incredibly elaborate shows a lot of the time you know and um, but uh, but we sell them which is different and um, and the the pace um, which I really enjoy. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would you just talk a little bit about you? You also do a management function for artists in terms of studio organization and. Yeah, I mean, you you sort of have to. I mean, some galleries even have people. You know, everybody within the larger galleries, they sometimes have point people within the gallery who they're responsible for certain artists, and they. Um, really give them their full attention, which is really quite quite necessary. Also, you know, artists have uh, quite often uh, several galleries that represent them. So you really want to kind of have your you know, the the voice of the gallery heard, and you want to have somebody there who's really able to sort of understand what's going on um, and make sure you're not missing anything because it's you know it's competitive, um, just like anything else. And so you want to be able to do that. But you also you know sort of talk about you know here we are. Brenda's going to be here talking about the marketplace. You want to be able to guide them in terms of pricing the work, and you have to look at the auction markets, and you have to look at things that you know that have gone on privately, and you have to sort of coordinate with the other galleries and make sure you're all on the same page. And so there really is, um, there, there's a lot of things that go on outside of just, you know, just you know, presenting the work and, and selling it. There is a, a large portion of your, your job that's the relationship to the artist, and then there's the marketing side. And in contrast, Rachel, as a private dealer and an art advisor, so much of what you do has to do with the relationship to the collector. So could you talk a little bit about what an art advisor does and what their sector of the market is? Sure, absolutely. And, and I'm pleased to say I probably have the slowest pace of anybody here, which makes me happy. Um, <laughs> and I feel fortunate because um, with my background, I. Uh, can work very individually with collectors, but I can also work very broadly. 
So I work with a wide range of collectors, uh, emerging uh, collectors, as well as seasoned collectors, and, and their needs are very different. Um, the, uh, the emerging collectors, um, we had a, a program uh, specifically geared towards that type of collector at the Kemper Museum, and uh, it really gave me a, an opportunity on the ground to work with a group of people who were new to contemporary art. Um, and it, it's clear that in the beginning, you have to spend a lot of time def defining your own eye. And you have to look and look and continue to look. And uh, you know, it's important to, do, to take collectors to artist studios. It's important to get publications in front of them. It's important to get them to feel comfortable with the art world because a lot of times uh, we in the art world don't make it very comfortable to walk into a, an art space. Um, it can be intimidating. So um, my job there was to, uh, to, to get new collectors to a place where they, they uh, felt comfortable in the art world and to start developing their own eye and to start coming to a conclusion of, as to what, what do I want to collect. Um, and then as most of you know, after you, you get to that point where you feel comfortable with saying, yes, I love that, I want to buy that, my husband and I agree, we're wild about it, let's do it. It's very empowering and um, it, it's, a, it's a great ride. And then for more seasoned collectors, it, it might be that they have already uh, come to a place where they've defined their collection um, and it may be more about the chase for that one specific piece to fill that uh, void in their collection. Um, and so it's highly individual. Um, I also help people with the practical side of things, um, collections management, uh, loan requests, uh, insurance, things like that. Um, do they want to open their homes to visiting groups from museums, uh, things of that nature? So you know, in the Midwest, uh, we have a, a just a broad, uh, a very wide variety, I guess, of different types of collectors with varied interests. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Um, I also am involved in uh, consulting primarily with public art projects, which um, is working on the, you know, the primary market, sourcing material from, from young contemporary artists, which I enjoy that very much. Uh, and, but I'm also working many times with a, a, a corporation or a municipality or a developer or something of that nature and there's a whole another set of issues <clears throat> in there um, but uh, in the in the private dealing I work with 19th and 20th century American art and contemporary art so I'm working with um, the primary market, which tends to be the gallery market. Um, I'm working with the secondary market, which could be the auction market, um, or uh, a private sale, uh, which would be the secondary market. Um, so I kind of touch upon all of those things um, at any given time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to spend just a moment talking about uh, the price of an artwork. Um, a gallery and an artist might set a price based on an artist's career, and yet at auction, the hammer goes down and the price is set. And um, that sort of sale impacts an artist's career and the availability of their work. Um, and no matter what price is established uh, for an artwork, a collector needs to understand the intrinsic value of, of a specific object and what's possible in terms of negotiation if you're gonna go buy that. So Sarah, how do you want a collector to research price before you meet with them? Um, and then, in, and how do you negotiate a sale? Well, I mean, in terms of what the, the collector sort of comes to the table with, you know, in terms of their information, I mean, for the most part, what's available to them are auction records. So, you know, I mean, and that, and that has really changed the, sort of the landscape of things uh, quite dramatically. and. Um, you know, now people really do focus on what something went for at auction, and, and 
So we have to be, you know, I, I don't follow the auction as closely, sort of widespread, but in terms of my artist, you just have to, because you have to, you know, be able to either legitimize a price that you have for a work, um, and, um, or, you know, it, it, it just, they have to sort of, you know, there has to be some kind of cohesion between the two. Um, you know, although I do, I do feel that, you know, it's difficult to sort of use that as sort of the, the, the standard, uh, because oftentimes, you know, there's so many, there's so much criteria that goes into an auction, and, um, and an auction result, it could be, you know, it could be condition, it could be sort of the, the kind of work there, there are certain artists that, that um, we can sort of have flashing behind us, um, and, and I can use it as an example, you know, sort of someone like Barbara Kruger, you know, who, her works from the 80s, you know, sort of that, you know, sort of everything as old as new again these days, and, you know, and so that, those are the kind of people, you know, really want to uh, collect those works from the, from the 80s. So oftentimes, you know, at auction, those, we don't have to, we don't worry, they usually mm -hmm. go, they, the prices go pretty high, and, and, and you can easily, if you have a work, because we also have to deal with not only the primary market, but we often get work that comes back to the gallery that we've either sold, and now the collector wants to sell it, and it comes back to us. So we are also active in the resale market, mm -hmm. you know, and secondary market as well. Um, and, um, you know, so often those prices, you know, sort of stand on, a, a stand on their own, and they're fine, but, but often for other things, you know, some of the works from the 80s that are a little bit maybe sort of tougher politically, or maybe don't have, you know, the, the visual imagery is a, little, is a little more difficult. There's a piece that I think has been coming up that says, our prices are insane. Um, and that sort of is riffing off of a popular uh, ad on TV on the, on the East Coast, sort of in the 80s. Um, and, uh, and the image I is sort of like this monster with blood pouring. Well, as you can imagine, that what isn't exactly you know something that everybody wants to sort of put in their home. Whether I mean it's it's sort of a it's a fabulous piece and it's funny and it's smart, but it's but it's tricky. So you know so to sort of try and understand the, the sort of the various things that sort of go into a price of that work um, is, uh, is is it's sort of difficult. But but we really do want people to sort of look at the trajectory of the of the artist's career, what they've done, what the piece means to them, um, and um, and how it will fit in their in their collection. Um, and sort of see that there's 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 sort of longevity there, and that there might be some room for the for the work to you know sort of go up in value, and um, but sometimes we, we do we do have to sort of battle with with prices that are sort of set in in public. So. Yes, they can they can be set quite high and yeah. suddenly change. Yeah, and then what we well, also there are also some private you know numbers that we know about in sales that happen privately as well that we can sort of talk about. But really, it's about. I mean, uh, this is something that we talked about. But it's about trust. And if you have a, a collector who really, who you've worked with for a long time, who's been buying the work for a long time, um, that you've sold other things to, you know, they, you have a relationship with that person as well. And so it's a conversation. And then sometimes it's tricky and not easy. But then, you know, you sort of have to, you know, go on gut. Yeah. So Rachel, you do, you you uh, focus on private sales. Okay. Can, so can you talk mm -hmm. about how you? What sort of uh, conversations you might have with a collector about price and mm -hmm. um, where you go and how do you establish value? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I try to do as much homework as possible before I have a have a conversation um, because my relationships really are uh, all about trust. I mean, all about trust and and integrity as a as a private dealer is incredibly important and. And you want your client to understand things. Uh, you want every transaction to be as transparent as possible so that they're comfortable. Um, and, you know, I also like to think about more than just um, the, the price itself. I mean, the price is very important, and you, you need to be able to substantiate that. But it's also about how important is this for this collection? Is it a minor thing, or is it really going to, to add some depth and breadth and be important? Um, because, for example, if we're buying something at auction, we might talk about what, what's the right price for this painting? Where do we stop? And so we have an agreement beforehand if I'm bidding on their behalf. Um, and sometimes that makes the most sense, but sometimes if the painting or object is just really going to, to do something for them, then I would encourage them to reach for it and to 
to buy the very best that they can buy by a, a given artist, and, and I think that's important. Um, I talk to collectors a lot about what their goals are, because sometimes their goal is just because they have a new house or there's a new business, and it's very simply that, and it's a practical nature. But other people are um, more inclined to be uh, building something towards a loftier goal, whether it's um, pure connoisseurship, or whether they are a patron, or they're doing it for their family, or they have some larger intention. And um, I've been very fortunate to, to, to witness some great collections being built um, and to, to return to my time with, with the Iris and B. Darrell Cantor collection. Um, he was a tremendous model for me because, uh, well, first of all, he, B. Darrell Cantor was a self-made man, sold hot dogs at Yankee Stadium, um, and then built an empire um, trading securities on a very, uh, a very thin margin. Uh, but he, he was a self-made sort of American dream guy. And um, he was one of the founders of uh, the Business Committee for the Arts, along with David Rockefeller. And they uh, brought forth this notion that, that art could be an I identifier for a company. Um, and he was one of, Mr. Kanner was one of the first uh, people to incorporate uh, like the, the uh, images of Rodin, particularly the thinker, as I noticed you had a stunning one out on your lawn when I drove past. Um, but he was one of the first people to incorporate uh, the image of his collection into the business and make it uh, an identifier or a symbol for his company, and he, he gave his top producing uh, traders Rodin sculpture as a gift, and he organized and circulated museum exhibitions all over the country, and he almost always left a piece or two behind. Um, and he gave major uh, groups of uh, sculpture to the LA County Museum, the Metropolitan, Stanford University, the Brooklyn Museum, and, and on and on. Um, so I have a strong model for some, if somebody wants to, uh, to do something besides just fill up an office building or a, a new lake house. Um, I love that opportunity and uh, just to, to get into this, the real connoisseurship of it. Price is important, but I don't know that it's always everything. And we all know, uh, you know that sometimes when you do have a, a record-breaking price that it, it changes things for that artist and that market and it's not always uh, you know good or bad it just it, it, it changes things and it has an interesting effect uh, down yeah. the line. Well, price is, is a very um, it's a concrete number but it also has a lot of psychological weight and so Alex would you talk a little bit about how you establish estimates a little, without giving away too many secrets about how, how established estimates, uh, sort of how you work on reserves, uh, pace bidding it, once you're in the auction, mm -hmm. and buying in, and what happens at that point. Okay, many questions. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me go one by one. So um, the estimates, I think that's the most logical um, place to start. The estimates are based and, um, it's a very, it's, it, it's really a very simple process because just like Sarah mentioned how she establishes prices, we establish prices. We um, look at the, we look at the retail prices. So if we're dealing with an artist that has, that is still alive and still has, uh, do, does work or is in the midst of his career or his or her career, um, you look at their pricing in the gallery you look at the availability at the gallery because the price alone at the gallery, at the primary market, doesn't tell you anything because quite honestly, if it's a so-called hot artist mm -hmm. and, they are, and he or she decides only to make four paintings in 2014 um, and they cost $300,000, doesn't tell you anything about the price level that somebody else would pay because um, and that's the big difference is, if I'm a little bit mean now, it's like, then I call the gallery world, um, you know, um, a non-democratic system 
because you decide who you're going to sell to, and uh, which is totally fair. Um, but uh, the auction, uh, when it comes to the auction world, and that's why prices get decided and get played out in different ways. Um, it's like somebody wanted this piece, couldn't get it in the gallery, or two people. All it takes is two people. Two people wouldn't get that piece in the gallery for $300,000. We start the auction process at $300,000. But these people keep bidding, and because, and, and this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is just like the way it is today for certain people, for the art world, because you're talking about the top of the top of wealth, quite honestly, that buys art. That, by the way, has not changed in 500 years. The Medici's were also not the cheapest people around. So um, <laughs> it, 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 there was always something about that. Wealth always liked art, and art always liked wealth. Um, that's just the way it is. Doesn't mean that uh, you have to be wealthy to appreciate art, have art, um, but it's just in, it, it plays out that way in a public view. So these two people go for this piece that they know retails for three hundred thousand dollars, but they can't get one retail because Sarah says, "I don't like you. I'm not selling it to you." <laughs> uh, <laughs> and. Um, no, but for instance, a gallery would not, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but a gallery would probably, if there, there are speculators that come in, there are certain people that come in that want to buy from you for $300,000 because they know they can get $600,000 tomorrow. Exactly. So yeah. that you wouldn't sell to those people. I have to sell to anyone. If you raise your hand in an auction room, I promise you I will sell it to you. Um, uh, no, but that's that's the big difference, and that's how sometimes wild prices that are that are very d different from the retail prices get established because two people know what it costs, but no, they want it, and they don't care if they pay three hundred or six hundred thousand dollars, and that skews the market, and that of course, and I'm very aware of this, that encourages um, pricing because that means that the next piece will be priced not three to four, but four to six, and might go for 700. So you are, you are in a development. What, um, and again, I'm saying this like very, very, um, I'm trying to remove myself emotionally here, because um, it is, the auction market has um, made artists' careers from a monetary perspective, but has also harmed artists' careers from a monetary perspective because, you know, this, this, this artist that we were just talking about that jumped prices might fall out of favor in the secondary market and it's not as hot anymore. And then you're stuck at a price level where you have a huge discrepancy between public records and primary prices and you're kind of stuck and the artist is stuck and the gallery is stuck and also the auction market is stuck because people come then back to me and said, well, I bought this here for $700,000. It was like, well, you know, now it's back to where the estimate was. So it's, uh, that's, just, uh, that's just what it is. So you have to be very careful and uh, believe it or not, we, we are, uh, I do deeply care about art and therefore about the artist. I have not the contact with artists because most artists don't like the auction market or at least officially they don't like the auction market, depending how they're doing. Um, and you have to be careful in not, you know, not oversaturating it. And this is, you know, we look at the sales, how many, I mean, Warhols you can have endless. But of, of, of younger artists where there is few product available, you can't fill your sale with multiple examples that are different in quality because that confuses the market. So you try to stay away from them. And quite honestly, we also that's also like a new trend that started in the last 10 years. Auction gave the primary market a little bit of breathing room traditionally. So it wasn't like sold yesterday and resold tomorrow. There were a couple of years or uh, you know, a couple of 10 years sometimes um, in between that, but that all has changed. So the market needs to adjust to that. And, and um, that's why it seems sometimes very menacing, what, 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 not what we're doing, because quite honestly, I'm just, I'm just reacting to the secondary market and I'm just reacting to the demand. And 80% of the time I'm right and 20% of the time what we come to the bought in part, mm -hmm. um, a piece buys in at auction, 
what this means is it literally fails to sell. So there is no buyer for this piece. Um, what happens after that is, and this is public, this is also a public record. Um, and what happens after that is it either goes back to the owner of, uh, of the work. Um, if there's a financial agreement, then it might go to someone else. It might go to the auction house and goes into inventory. That's also a new game that we're playing now. And, um, or, or someone comes in after the sale and says, well, you know what? It didn't sell for $100,000 offer the owner $70,000 and see what happens. And then it comes from a public place into a private place, meaning these are, these are not numbers that we're publishing because we're obligated to publish list prices at auctions, but post sales, what happens with those pieces? I mean, if you call me, I will tell you, but uh, we're, not, we're not publishing it anymore. Did I get all of yeah, the answers? Very yeah. good. Very, very good. Can I, can but, I yes, follow please. up on, on yeah. what he was saying, too, in, in terms of how we price things on the primary market? And often we do have to look at the auction prices. Um, it, it's, it's quite important. But, uh, you know, I think um, not every gallery, but, but we believe that, you know, we don't want to, if, if an, uh, an artist that we have has an extraordinarily, you know, sort of high auction record, we try to not then raise prices to meet that. Because just as, you know, as the auction um, prices go up, and the, you know they also come down, and in the, as a gallery, and, and when you're dealing with the primary market, you can't raise the prices and then lower them. Um, that is, you know, you just you have to sort of keep it slow and steady, and uh, sort of be more responsible with your pricing and not and not rely too heavily on 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 how they how it relates to their auction prices. But but you have to keep it in mind for sure. Um, it, that, that's. That's something that's really important. And then also, as a gallerist, you have to be ready to protect your artist's work at, um, at auction, too. So when there are things that you know that, are gonna, that will probably do well, that's great. But then you know, when you have an artist who has sort of uh, works in the you know, uh, various uh, uh, you know, mediums, you know, there are some, some bodies of work that, that do quite well at auction, and there's some things that don't. So you have to be prepared to be responsible for anything that comes up at auction. So the things that do well, that's great. But then if there's something that yet that you might be more concerned about, but you believe in strongly, and you know this is your artist, and you're you're looking at the big picture here, you have to be ready to to protect it. And sometimes we buy things from auction uh, that um, that people put up uh, for uh, for sale. I mean, often we'd like it when obviously when uh, a collector brings things back to us, but that doesn't always happen. And um, and that's just the way it works, and so, but we have to be prepared to, to So, to So that. You, you are often in the auction room with, when you have artists. Usually on the phone. Yeah, yeah. but you're, you're at the auction, yeah. and you're either uh, bidding or, or, or you've already arranged to have somebody else that's bidding for that work mm -hmm. as a way of protecting the artist. Mm -hmm. And then also I think there's a lot of conversation that you do that, that occurs between the gallery the gallerist and the artist, because as you say, the prices can never come down, and um, you because you have a responsibility also to the collector at that point. Yes. Yeah. So it's 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 a tricky business, mm -hmm. and I think that it, it's very interesting because you know it is very transparent what happens during the course of the auction, but you know you work hard to make sure that there are two bidders at every auction, <laughs> so that you know it it. So that you have the, the sales result that you're well, after. Of course, yeah. Yeah, as as do you. Yeah, so that's wonderful. Could we talk about kind of some of the exceptional sales that have happened at Sotheby's? 2008, when uh, Sotheby's London mm -hmm. uh, sold uh, Damien Hirst's work, beautiful inside my head forever. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, you, you dealt directly with an artist. You mm -hmm. bypassed the primary art market and offered works for sale at auction. Um, you've also, uh, Alex, uh, initiated a, uh, S2, which mm -hmm. is a retail gallery situation mm -hmm. for artworks, so that really what you're doing is you're beginning to mix up uh, the roles between primary and secondary markets. Yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about this, and talk a little bit about how much of these sales is about speculation and how much is about possession and how much is about love of the okay. object. All right. Again, you're giving yeah. me a couple of questions in one go. Well, so that's because you talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So the Damien Hirst sale, it will be also beautiful in my, in my head forever, um, was on September 15th, uh, 2008, which was the evening in London of the morning that Lehman Brothers collapsed which was a very, that's obviously that's why I remember the date, but it was a fascinating moment where real world and art world crashed and nothing happened. Um, because the art world collapsed later, it took, it, it took some time. So the reaction in the auction room, we raised about $200 million that one evening. Um, for only works by Damien Hirst, so for those of you who don't know, you see some installation shots, but it was, and it was quite honestly, it was Damien's genius, it was not the evil empire of Sotheby's that came up with this idea. Um, it was the artist who said, you know what, I'm gonna do this myself. It was really the, as we know now, the height of the art market where everything was selling. It was a very good point in, in Damien's career. Um, and he said, okay, I wanna do this. And um, the funny thing is internally in the auction house, we had lots of discussions about the repercussions that will come from that. Because not only does this mean we're very much upsetting the galleries, um, but we're, 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 we're going out there with something that really can't be repeated because if it works, other artists will come and want to do the same thing. There are maybe, even at that point back then, there were two or three artists that you could have done this with. Nothing else would have worked with Damien. It would have worked maybe with Jeff Koons. It would have worked maybe at that point with Takashi Murakami. It would have worked. But that was about, in Richard Prince, uh, but that was about it. So there were, we were very aware of the repercussions this might have. Um, luckily or not luckily, uh, the world around us collapsed. So therefore, the sale is kind of stands there alone and will not be repeated for a very long time because the system worked but the system came at a time where everything around it collapsed. So it was a very fascinating experience. And in a funny way, um, it was also a, a, a very, a very um, you know, sobering experience for Damien and Damien's market because his market was hit very hard after that. People say because of the auction, other people say because not the auction. It was probably a, like a, a, a coin, it was a lot of elements were coinciding. But since then, the market was never as high while other markets quickly recovered. Damien Hurst's market has not, I mean, it's still a market. And this, by the way, has nothing to do with quality. I personally love his work and I think he's one of the most important artists of his generation, one of the three most important artists of his generation. Um, the Shark will always be like one of the great artists, artworks of the end of the 20th century. Um, but his market and him taking it on without, and there you see the strength of a gallery, if you are represented by a strong gallery and you have strong people in the gallery, they protect you as an artist as well and don't shove out the door like hundreds of works at the same time because of course it will, it will be a problem afterwards. And um, so this is what happened in the sale and you probably, I, I will not say never again, but um, I will say that probably not very soon something like this will happen. And that said, um, I, I am trying and my desire is to go more in the, in, the, in the private sale and eventually in the primary market because we have the opportunity. Um, we, have, we have a huge enterprise at Sotheby's. We have lots of people. We have lots of people that are passionate about art, that love art. Um, and we have lots of collectors that turn to us. There are collectors that love to deal with galleries. There are collectors that love to deal with auction houses because it's all very transparent and democratic. Um, and, but most of our collectors collect both. I've never been to a collection of any, of any significance that only buys at auction or that only buys in galleries. They mix up because <clears throat> the collectors are collectors. Now I'm coming to your third question. The speculation. The money is so high 
that and the people that are the collectors today, the new generation of collectors, are, because you have to have the money to pay for it, are money-oriented people and are savvy people. That's it. Passionate, but savvy. So that said, that there is no, there is no speculative thought in people's heads, I don't believe that. So, because if you spend a hundred million dollars on a painting, you have to feel good about this also from a money perspective. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I also have to tell you that I have never, and I have tried, get someone to buy something of any significance and they felt nothing about this painting, about the sculpture, and there was no emotional reaction. So a pure speculative buyer, in my opinion, does not exist. Because, you know, if you, if you look at the you know, top 100 list of rich people in America, 10 of them collect art. The other 90 could definitely afford it, uh, but they don't, and you can't get them to do this because they don't feel it. And no matter how wealthy or not wealthy the people are, they have a gut, you have to have a gut reaction. You have to have this passion to say, I love it, I hate it, it makes me angry, it makes me happy, it turns me on, it does something. But you have to have this, and that's very important, and you can't block it out. I try to like go to funds to fund this, it doesn't make any sense from a financial perspective. So the passion is there, and that's the great thing, and that's the saving grace of all these prices. People love what they're buying, and always regret what they don't buy, never what they buy no matter how much they pay for it. No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, why are we all in the business? Yeah. It's a passion. Yeah. It's a passion for artists and for artworks. And you're very fortunate, Rachel, that, that, that you work with pa passionate collectors. Mm -hmm. But how do you help them navigate a speculative market? And what sort of discussions do you have? Obviously, budget is one. Yeah. But beyond that. Absolutely. Well, and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate because as I am an appraiser uh, as well, I can see a lot of different sides of the market. So I, I can bring that information to the table, but I, I still am at the point where I feel as though the passion is very much the, the primary thing. And you're never going to lose money if, or you're never going to be you're never going to be in a losing situation if, if the market goes down, but you still love your object. So I guess I try to do matchmaking in that sense. Um, I, I just try to, to encourage people to do what I feel is best for their, the aesthetics of their collection, and I try to, to help them make a good business decision at the same time. So it's a, it's a marriage of all those facts. Um, but I'm not... Uh, I'm not a big, um, I, I look at the market and I see this bubble and it does concern me because what I see every time I sit down and do an appraisal, I do a market analysis and I sort of, I rethink it every month or so, is the same thing going on or what are the trends and, and all of that and kind of what I see is there's this top, you know, maybe 10 or 20 percent, I don't know, you probably know better than I do. That, that the prices are just crazy, and then everything from sort of that two-thirds down, it's, it's very soft, and there are some tremendous artists, uh, especially, I would say, mid-career artists, who are selling, or producing and selling you know, fantastic bodies of work, and you could buy a, the best picture that they have for you know, 30,000 to 40,000, or something in that range, and there is just so much of that out there um, that, um, and part of it may be coming from a, a, you know, again, an artist background and seeing that and sort of seeing my father sort of be an artist that I consider to be a, a very important and good artist, sort of not be represented in that, in that maxed out category and, and being frustrated by that. But, but for, I think probably for most artists, the reality is that it, it's a struggle to, to get out there. It's a, struggle, it's a struggle to be recognized. For many artists, it's a struggle to just get a gallery to recognize them, much less to actually make a sale. 
And um, you know, it's it's just a very the art world. It's very big and very, uh, I would say, polarized polarized right now, in my opinion. Um, so uh, again, I as if I'm working with an individual, I'm just trying to serve their needs as an individual in the best way possible. But there's just a lot to a lot to consider, and and I wonder what will happen. Yeah. You know, because. Uh, well, you, you think that it can't keep up, but it's been keeping up like this for a very long time. So I guess only time will really tell. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting point that you're making. It's, um, but it's a difficult one because you, you, you're speaking about the artists that we all know of, artists of our generation mm -hmm. that are mid-career mm -hmm. and that are not achieving the prices that a young um, artist that just came out of, of, of Yale or something like that. Um, did in the in the after their first show, um, and that's <clears throat> I think there's a <clears throat> excuse me there's a very clear or maybe it's not so clear but um, I've seen it in categories because there is there's the emotional market that responds to something new. This emotional market being driven by again I'm sorry I'm mentioning money again, but creates a craze creates desire because there is a there's there, there there's a socio-political aspect of art or of, of art in the right society it's like if you have that I need to have that and if I, he has that I need to have that too so that creates a buzz and that elevates prices <clears throat> then you have the 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 artist the art and the artist that really achieves the mega prices like the ones that you're speaking of the 50, 100 million dollar prices. But these at the end of the day, if you look at them very closely, it's a handful of artists. It's two handful of artists. And there you have art history coming into the equation. They also go through, through ups and downs. There's moments for Warhol, there's moments for Rothko, but they're always on a steady incline because we know by now, I think, in the, up to the 60s, art is always advanced um, over the people that buy it or the people that talk about it. But um, I would say 50 years after, after the, the, the first Warhol paintings, we can probably say, um, I feel confident saying that Warhol is one of the greatest artists of all times, but definitely of the 20th century. So art history, if you look back, is extremely brutal, and that's not the market. That's the scholarship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of every generation, you have th three to five artists that remain at the highest level. If you go further back mm -hmm. in the Impressionist field, in the modern field, even in the old master field, mm -hmm. uh, in the Renaissance, in the Baroque, in the Manuris, you have a couple of names and a couple of individuals. You have great artists around them. They were, they were, they were almost fantastic, but didn't quite reach it, and they, in the old master's world, you can buy a great old master for $20,000. But if you want to buy a Rubens or a Rembrandt, a great one, you can't get it. But if, let's say, you would, how much do you insure the Mona Lisa for? So the, the, you know, these, are <clears throat> these are funny questions that you're asking. So there is a segmentation that is done by the market, but there's a segmentation that is done by art history also. And that somehow justifies for me, although the numbers are abstract, I can say to a collector, and I said to this collector, <clears throat> you saw the uh, Andy Warhol car crash, um, and someone paid 105 million dollars for it. And I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a wild amount of money. But I can, with confidence, say to this collector: If you have the money and if you love the painting, I will tell you that this painting is right here is one of the greatest painting of one of the greatest artists. So going with this trajectory, you cannot be wrong, even at this price level. We'll see. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, no, we'll see, we'll absolutely. See. I'm just wondering whether people in the audience might have any questions that they'd like to ask the panel. Um, and while the microphones are coming, are there questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> uh -huh. um, the microphones are on their way. There's a, there's a question here and there's a question in the back. Um, uh, Sarah, would you like to just 
say just I, I think that you've 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 um, hit on something about scarcity because once an artist is no longer with us, obviously it's a finite body of work. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, can you talk a little bit about you know what happens mid career and sometimes? No, well that I mean you said a couple of things that were interesting. I mean one was about you know how there are only a few mm -hmm. artists who are really sort of hitting sort of the big numbers at auction, and that's the truth. And you know there are you know, hundreds and thousands of galleries representing hundreds and thousands of artists, but when we're constantly sort of having to go back to the auction records to look at that, you know, we're always, we're wrestling against numbers that are only, you know, and, and high prices that are really only gotten by a very few artists. So that's something that we always have to wrestle with. Um, and then b back to also sort of speculation and artists saying that they were, you know, um, and people say, you know, I, you have that, so I want that. And that, that is what is really tricky for us as well, because you know you're talking about passion, but sometimes you know the sort of say like this person has it, so I want it. That passion actually is about ownership. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily about like wanting that object. And I do deal with that a lot in Los Angeles, and um, and part of the reason you know as sort of the uh, sort of the gatekeepers to the sort of the primary market and artists, we do have to protect you know their 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 their. their their work and put it in collections that we believe are solid and, and worthy. I mean, you know, what that necessarily means, but we have we don't sell to everybody, and we do have to be careful about about somebody who literally is buying it because they heard from their buddy, you know, at um, you know at the agency that 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 was what they should have, and so then they want it, and we just want to have a more stable environment for the work, and so that it doesn't then go recycle back in, into. Um, uh, you know, to the auction houses, or even to us. I mean, we, you know, it, it really we want we want things to to go to places where they'll be loved and um, and 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 get you know and stay there for a long time. So um, I mean, I do appreciate the sort of the democracy of the auctions because I do think that sometimes you know galleries can sort of take it a bit too far, and sometimes it's based on people who've been buying from the from the gallery for a long period of time. And that, you know we have a relationship with them, and so there, there's there's so many different things that go into that, and I think that there is a place for for the auction houses for sure, but but we also have to do the opposite, and we have, you know the, the other side has to exist in order to really try and keep things somewhat stable for for artists, um, you know young old mid career, and and with the mid career artists, you know it's it's a, it's a struggle, you know it's absolutely a struggle, and um, that's a way we just try and keep things you know, sort of at a, at a nice, comfortable level, and we have to make sure that people sort of understand, you know, that the whole body of work, you know, everything that they've done, and, um, and you know, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. We have a question in the audience. Yes. Uh, I have a question uh, for Sarah about uh, how do you go about pricing a young artist's work, somebody who hasn't had a lot of shows, but you think the work is absolutely terrific. How do you guide them on where to start? Well, uh, to be honest, I mean, the artists that, that, that I've worked with, sort of younger artists, um, for the most part, we're not sort of the first gallery that they're showing with, you know? So to, there a lot of times we're, all, we're showing artists and we're taking on young artists, sort of comparatively to other artists that we show, who already have had sort of a market. There's been a buzz, they've been, they've been in shows, they've been in sort of smaller, sort of more <coughs> alternative spaces. So there is some sense of, of, of where, uh, where their prices lie. Um, I've always been really conservative in pricing. I just think it it, it really uh, it's it's just the it's just a smarter way to go. Um, I've yeah, I've seen too many people sort of sort of crash and burn. Their prices get too high. And like I was saying before, you know, I mean, you can you can always go up, but you can't go down. And so um, you know, it's hard because you're often sort of fighting with, sometimes with the artists themselves, you know, because they see these people around them making so much money so quickly, and that is intoxicating. I mean, that's attractive, I get that, you know? I mean, so, uh, you know, so it, it's hard when the money can possibly be there, but again, we sort of look at the sort of the, the long view, not, not the short view, so we really try and pace ourselves, but again, sometimes we're dealing with other dealers who also represent the artists who have a different view, so, you know, it's, it's a game you play. You just try to buy it, be as, you know, smart and careful and thoughtful as possible. But, you know, sometimes it can also be um, uh, sort of attractive, you know, to the dealer. You know, you have somebody who's 
you know, and sometimes you also, the, the prices get higher, maybe the demand isn't as great, you know what I mean? You sort of price out some, you know, just the people who are speculators so that they won't then buy the work and then just flip it immediately and then sell it. So there's so many things that go into it, but, uh, but we, I tend to be on the more conservative side. I think we have a question in the back. Jim, can you take the mic back? Yes. Um, could someone speak to how a collector would figure out how to go about selling a work that was a work of not maybe Andy Warhol value, but value, uh, you know, fairly valuable piece? How do you even figure out what route to take? How do you know? Do you go to the auction house? Do you go back to the dealer from whom you purchased it? Do you find a resale? How does that, does the internet? affect a sale and how do you even figure the whole thing out? All three of us would answer this question differently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but the right answer is, if you're really unsure, is probably <laughs> to go to Rachel. <laughs> and no, but to go to someone that you trust, an art advisor that knows the, the, the pros and the cons. There, is, there's, there are certain instances that even I would tell you go back to the dealer because they might know much more about this artist market than I do. There might be instances where I say go to auction because there are so many people out there that want this piece that you have <clears throat> that you're, if you're already dis making this decision that you're, that you're selling it, you might as well get the most money for it. So it really, it really depends what the artwork is. I, and, 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 and the smartest thing to do is to go to someone, to speak to someone that you trust, that knows the art world, um, and that can make this for you. The internet will give you half answers. The internet is very good in giving half answers, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and it gives options, but doesn't help you make a decision. Because um, you know, if we, we do, at the end of the day, know what we're doing. Uh, we do this for a living. Um, one price on a man portrait is not the same thing as a price on a woman portrait. Uh, although they might look the same, there's their, 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 their date issues, their media issues. So anyway, so I think the right thing to do is, is, is to go to an advisor. Or if you have the time and want to spend the time, go to the gallery that you bought it from, speak to them, go to the auction house, speak to them go to an advisor to speak to them and uh, you know, then make up your own mind. It, unfortunately, there's no formula. And there's one other place, is that if the artist is no longer living, go to the estate and, right. and talk to them as well because they may have a perspective yeah. on which market is, sometimes you want, you need a rapid sale, sometimes you need yeah. a confidential sale, right. and the estate usually knows more about that than anyone else, than, than even an, an art Absolutely. advisor. Yeah. Or you give it to the museum. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Giving to the museum is, is the right answer. <laughs> okay, we have a question in the back. Hello, good evening. I've got a letter of high interest from uh, Christie's Auction House about my artwork. Uh, but, um, I, and I've got a few collectors lining up to purchase the artwork, but I don't know what to price it uh, at because the Smithsonian said that I needed an art appraiser in order to sell my artwork because I'm connected to many leaders, Emperor Haile Selassie, Royal House of Watson. Welcome, Sarah, pleasure to see you, uh, as well as uh, other leaders. So this makes me uh, you know, somewhat in a quandary as to how to price my artwork. Can someone help me? Sarah. Have you, have you sold the work? Well, the work? at a gallery in uh, London, uh, Addison Ross Gallery, and the mall galleries was inviting me to come back to uh, exhibit. But, they, but they've actually sold your work? And, they uh, sold 14 pieces, actually. 14, you know, water was this, And this was recently? It was uh, in 82, 83, mid, mid, no, mid-90s, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, well. Um, gosh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it really, sales you know, sales prices are sort of based on past, you know, sales prices. So often, you know, you, there, it, it's 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 connected to that. I would imagine that 
If you haven't had that many sales since then, um, okay, well then great. I mean, really, I mean, the, what the work is, you know, the work is sort of priced at what, what it's, what it's, you know, sort of based on the previous sales that have come before it. So really, But you and you don't have any record of what what. I do indeed have a record of the, of the uh, work that they sold. I had to sell it to people to provide the water from the five thousand to collect your and put the pumps in. So uh, you want to add? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you then you have you actually have a very very specific idea of, of, of what these things are selling for because you know because they're selling at that price. So I mean, I would just say that like I wouldn't deviate too much from. From the from the prices that you've had, you know, in the past, or but then, I mean, the more the most recent record of sale is 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 the what you should use as, as sort of your your barometer, I would say. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do we have a one more? We have time for one more question, right well, down. Oh, Michelle. Hi, um, I'm just curious if um, any of the three of you might comment a little bit about the discrepancy between prices for female artists versus male artists. We're seeing a lot of um, prices uh, on the screen up there, and of course, um, most of them, most of the high prices are for men. And you know, this is a, a, a constant conversation in the art world. Um, and I'm just curious what any of the three of you, or all of the three of you, um, think about it and have to say about it. Thank you. It's a problem. <laughs> well, yeah. well, it's not just a problem in terms of pricing. It's, in, it's, it's a historical problem of the visibility of women artists. Yeah, I mean, it exists and, in every level. And the value of the works that, they're being, that are being made. Yeah. I don't know. You're you looking you? at me? Yeah. yeah. The only man, yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's a, again, it's a historical problem that didn't start last year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, it went through history. I actually do think that um, the art world and the, the private world or the public world made progress. Um, I believe that um, our generation, and I believe definitely that the generation of my children will not make a distinction if it's a woman, if it's a woman who painted that or a man who painted that. And that's, I think, the ultimate goal, that the gender is not important, just the quality of the artwork speaks. And that's something that many people fight, rightfully so. Um, I personally don't see why I see quality differences. If one is better and happens to be a man, it should be more expensive. If one's better and happens to be a woman, it should be more expensive or more, or more shown. But I think museums are doing an effort in, 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 in displaying this. And therefore, the market is also, also reacting. And I think that if I just go quickly in my head in the last 10 years, um, I think we've seen a lot of price development of established contemporary women artists. If it's because you have one here, which I didn't see today, but Eva Hesse has enormous prices. Louise Bourgeois just broke auction records left, right, and center. Rosemary, because we see her here, Barbara Kruger. Cindy, yeah. so you see a generational shift and an understanding. We're not there yet, but I do believe we're going in the right direction. Okay, um, I want to thank you all for being here with us. I know that there are lots of more questions. Unfortunately, we 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 have um, some time considerations this evening. Thank you. Um, I want to encourage you to visit the website, which side up, and you can hear you you'll be able to hear past lectures and also find out about future lectures and our next lectures in January. Thanks so much for being a great audience.